Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, and we're joined by Andrew Hunter, who is the Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, the DIIG, or the DIG, uh, over here. Andrew, thanks very much for joining us. Um, you produced a uh, fact action-packed report, but it does have a, a slightly dry title, I think, uh, Federal Research and Development Contract Trends and Supporting Industrial Base 2000 to 2015, um, simulating title, but tell us a little bit about why you produced uh, the report and what its central findings are. Well, thanks, Vago, and believe me, it is a page turner, uh, and we're going to get a, a sexy uh, cover photo so that people know that. Uh, and if you're at all interested in this, actually, it is a page turner, but. <laughs> so we did this report uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is it's actually the third in a series, and we've previously looked at services contracts and uh, uh, contracts for products, and so looking at R&D kind of completes the cycle, if you will. Maybe we'll start back over on services next year. Uh, the second reason is that in an era when the focus uh, pretty much at the Department of Defense of everyone and in Congress as well is on technological superiority, uh, R&D is definitely the part of the system that merited a really close look, and so that's what we set out to do. And what are your um, central, what are the three sort of core findings? Well, uh, the three core findings are number one, that R&D has really suffered from sequestration and the budget drawdown. And uh, let me just say, uh, you know, there's two things that happened in the Department of Defense in the last six years. One is that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan started to wind down and a lot less money was being spent. The second was sequestration of the Budget Control Act. Uh, and s people sometimes ignore the fact that that was, a, you know, the combined effect of the two is quite, uh, quite enormous. Uh, contracts at DOD have fallen 35 percent over the last six years, much more than the budget as a whole has. Um, and R&D really has suffered disproportionately in that. And, uh, you know, this was predicted uh, when sequestration first hit. Frank Kendall predicted it. Others predicted it. Uh, and it turns out that it is the case. R&D contracts have declined over 50 percent, so substantially more than other contracts, uh, almost twice as much uh, than non-R&D contracts. Uh, and so that's the first big finding. The second big finding is an interesting case of, so, wh you know, uh, what drove that reduction? A, a lot of concern has been expressed, and it's a reasonable concern, that uh, the department would eat its seed corn. And we interpret seed corn to mean the early stages of R&D, you know, kind of that initial effort. Uh, that has come down. It has suffered. But it hasn't suffered nearly as much as R&D as a total. What really suffered is the later stages of R&D. Uh, building actual prototypes, building actual systems, getting them ready for production. Uh, that has just plummeted, falling uh, over 70 percent uh, in the case of the uh, system design and development contracts. The third big finding then is related to that, which is what is this doing to the industrial base? And what you find is that the big five defense contractors uh, that we all know and love, uh, who are primarily the parts of industry that are building those big weapon systems uh, have taken a dramatic reduction in their contracts for research and development. Uh, now they haven't, you know, they're still making money, they're still in business, uh, they're still finding ways to build product and to do services, but on the R&D side, uh, they have lost uh, almost 50% of their share of the R&D market. And keep in mind that that market is now 50% smaller. So this is a really startling uh, and massive uh, change in the outlook, uh, and it, I think, begins to uh, throw some light on why our companies maybe not as excited to put their own money into R&D uh, when you see that their revenues have declined so much coming from the department. But Frank Kennel, uh, the uh, Pentagon uh, Undersecretary for uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, um, had asked the defense companies to you know step up to start investing more money. Um, obviously, this is important investment for the companies for their future competitiveness. And some companies, for example, Raytheon being a good exception uh, example, um, invested a lot of money. One next generation d jammer, one uh, the advanced missile defense radar, uh, and and other contracts. You could look at. Northrop's investment, you know, Northrop would claim that its investment allowed it to succeed in the B-21 program. Um, are the companies themselves stepping up? Are they putting their more of their skin in the game to make sure that even if the government's not spending, they're positioning themselves to win for the future? Well, and I think, you know, this is kind of where the executives are going to earn their money because uh, the, the, the spending has come down uh, dramatically, as I've, as I've mentioned. Uh, but it's not zero, right? There's still money being spent. There's still money coming out the door. There's still a handful of new systems in, that are in the pipeline and that are hopefully going to make it through into actual production programs. And the trick, if your industry is to figure out uh, which are the ones that are really going to make it, 
so that I'm investing in those and not wasting money investing in things that aren't actually going to uh, make it down the pike into production? Uh, and secondly, am I making the right investments to actually win those competitions? Uh, and that's where I think you know, you've seen that uh, the senior executives are placing their bets. Uh, they're doing what they think is necessary uh, to win that competition. And, and you know, it's early at this point to say, you, you've, noted, you know, you've mentioned a couple of the big wins that some of the competitors have had. It's a little early to you know, sort of call the match at this point. Uh, but I do think that you're going to see uh, some real differentiation in performance among, uh, in industry based on whose bets pay off and who didn't do as good a job in placing those bets. The, the second piece that I want to say, though, is uh, you know, this does drive a real human capital problem. Uh, and that came up at our event that we just had earlier today with Steve Welby, where he talked about you know, the criticality of having next generation bright people, engineers who think creatively and are innovators, come into the defense space and the defense industry. And when you see these kind of declines on both the DOD side and to some extent with industry internal funding, it's going to be a challenge to keep those people and to recruit them and to keep them interested in defense. I want to ask you about some of the things that, uh, that uh, Steve Welby did talk about, the ddr &E at the Pentagon. But one of the questions uh, that I do have for you is, on a net basis, how much more investment needs to be directed to R&D to make up that shortfall on a dollar base? You know, if you're the next administration, you're coming in, whether it's Democrat or Republican, what are some of the things the new administration has to do to position itself properly to get the R&D train back on track? Well, so I would say that uh, the, the peak that we were at prior to the drawdown uh, was not an unreasonable peak for R&D. In fact, when we're in a period where we think that our strategy is going to depend on a new push for technological superiority, uh, I would say that at a minimum I would want to get back to where we were before, before the budget drawdown began. Uh, so that would mean that R&D contracts would then need to increase. Obviously, if you come down 50%, you have to go back up a little more than 50% you know, to get back to where you started. And what's the number? What 50%, just so our audience knows, when you say 50%, what's the number we're talking about now on an annualized basis for R&D investment? So for, um, for, for the contract space, it's around $40 billion. Uh, the overall R&D investment is uh, a little over $70 billion. So, uh, uh, and, and as was mentioned, about two-thirds of that com gets out the door either through contracts or grants. We focused on the contracts piece, the money that's going to your traditional industry uh, and non-traditional industry. Uh, and so, so a 50% increase there would be, you know, to get back to where you were on the order of 20 to $25 billion. Um, talking about what Steve Welby said, obviously the administration is in its waning days. Um, there obviously is a lot of discussion. Uh, Will Roper, the Dr. Will Roper, the head of the Strategic Capabilities Office, talked to reporters last week. Steve Welby is talking now. Um, Dr. Carter takes every opportunity to talk about, you know, innovation initiative, third offset, um, outreach to Silicon Valley, um, um, Strategic Capabilities Office. You know, Bob Work is doing that also. Frank Kennel does that as well. As you look at the portfolio of changes that have happened, and you were part of that with the Rapid Equipping Force as well, what are some of the elements you think are the ones that should survive, and where do you think uh, perhaps there are new opportunities and new avenues of exploration for the next team? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I would say, just let me just say in general, from a philosophical perspective, uh, I do think this we're in an era where allowing a thousand flowers to bloom is probably the right approach because it isn't crystal clear. Uh, what the exact right uh, method or technique is going to be that's going to be the most successful or which technology to place. You know, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket on a single technological approach. So because so much is changing on so many different fields at once. It is, and it's unpredictable, and we just don't know. Uh, you know, a lot of this depends on advancements happening in the commercial world, the commercial sector, and there are unexpected breakthroughs that happen there, uh, and things happen you didn't foresee. Uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, no one would have said, there's going to be this company called Facebook that's one of the largest, you know, <laughs> most powerful companies in the world. So uh, I do think that having a diversity of ways to attack the problem is a good thing. And I wouldn't want to see a new administration come in and say, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to cut back on all this stuff. It's too redundant. Now, having said that, it does make sense, as Ash Carter did with DIUX, to say, you know, we tried something. It's not working exactly the way we anticipated, so we're going to make a change. And I think that's very fair doing a 2.0 version, or if something's really not working, okay, fine, uh, close it down, take a different approach. But I, I would just warn against sort of trying to consolidate all these efforts into a single way of achieving innovation. I think the diversity is good. Uh, the next administration has an opportunity potentially to increase that diversity. I would like to see uh, more mechanisms that can link up with uh, with 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 
financing in the commercial market, right? So to get even closer to how the technology is being invested in in the commercial sector and taking off, not just waiting for industry to develop it and then uh, try to harvest it down the line. Now, the department actually has a pretty good history with that over time, uh, as is often mentioned about the Internet and DARPA, uh, that they are uh, they have had a lot of success historically investing in things that become big in the commercial sphere. Uh, and I think there's more that can be done in that area. Andrew Hunter of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, thanks for joining us. Thank you.